Introduction. Welcome. This video is not something that you'll just watch quickly while sipping your morning coffee or you're laying down and relaxing. This video is a research project. You may need to watch it multiple times. To begin, let me ask you a question. Do you believe the mainstream narrative? This is a yes or no question. You can't be halfway on it because what we're about to cover is drastically different from what we've been taught in the schools. Many will reject this information and most likely respond with scorn and attacks, most likely because these Vanderbilts are essentially worshipped. I ask you, do you believe in the mainstream narrative? And to be more specific, I mean in regards to the Robert Barons, the people who literally created modern America, the Gilded Age. Do you believe the story we are given in regards to these wealthy capitalists who supposedly lived rags to riches? They just worked hard to get where they were and just so happened to get lucky and become the richest people on the planet. Then, they continued to achieve some of the most advanced architectural and technological leaps ever seen for this time period. If you believe that these men truly built America and built all these old world structures in America, then let me redirect you, I think you landed on the wrong video. Here, the History Channel, the best source for us to learn about our history. Let's see what they have to offer. Oh look, a new show on the Gilded Age and Robber Barons. This must be everything we need to know. You can go watch this if you believe the story they tell us. You know, it's kind of insane that they made this. It's kind of some weird drama that continues this age-long propaganda involving some characters that have some shady histories. It's sad that people just accept these stories without any questions. I thought the History Channel was there to educate us. Well, I believe that these robber barons and all their achievements deserve to be questioned. I mean, after all, the Vanderbilts were literally the richest people on the planet. They were the kings and queens of America. These robber barons were the rock stars, the first celebrities. They were the Bill Gates mixed with the Kardashians, but this was a hundred years ago and they essentially set the standard. They had massive yachts, mansions, and properties the likes of which have never been truly matched. The media and the history books covered for them and painted them as the heroes of America, the great philanthropist. But they were not immune to criticism. They say these detractors were just other competitors who were jealous, but they had many critiques throughout time. One of the most popular rumors was that Cornelius Vanderbilt obtained his riches out of nowhere. That he was cruel, stern, and hated all of his kids except the only one of them that showed slight promise. It's said that they were in cahoots with many state legislators and that anyone who disagreed with him within his family, including his mother and his wife, would be sent to an asylum. If that isn't suspicious enough, no other American dynasty can match the amount of European Gothic mansions that they built, and no other family has them as well preserved and intact. So we must start with the Vanderbilts. There's even more to cover, but in order to fully present my case, we must first cover the history of the Vanderbilts from an alternative point of view. And yes, that means questioning the status quo. The Dutch. So when it comes to the Vanderbilts, the story always starts with Cornelius Vanderbilt, or the Commodore. But what does that even mean, and what is his past? The issue becomes that when you want to look into their past, the biographers want to paint Cornelius and the whole family of Vanderbilts as slowly working their way to riches. That is crucial for them to support their claims to their wealth. Like I said, their main critiques is that they were upstarts or people that gained a mouse amount of wealth from nowhere, in other words, an industry plant. So of course, when you read into this, they're going to tell you that people named Vanderbilt slowly built up property and wealth just as these small town Dutch farmers in New York. What they won't tell you is that this seems to be part of some type of secret royal family once you start to just dig a little bit deeper. What we are talking about is the Dutch colonization of America. Now, 
we have to understand how America was being operated by multiple different forces during this time period. But were these multiple forces? No, these were Vatican-owned forces. Let's just take a look at a map for a second. All of Europe was owned by the Venetians at this point, and I can prove that by just looking at the heraldry. First, we have to start with the Dutch Golden Age, which was also called the Dutch Miracle. What we have to understand is that each one of these countries was essentially a corporation in the eyes of the Venetian ancient families that then became the Venetians. If you're new and that's confusing, you'll have to watch our other videos to get a full breakdown on that transition. But you really don't even need to know that. Just look. It's called Leo Belgicus, Latin for the Belic Lion, which was used in both heraldry and map design to symbolize the former lower countries with the shape of a lion. Look at this. You can even see the Florida Lee. I thought this was a French symbol. What about the double-headed phoenix? Why is this on a Dutch map? It's also accompanied by the Dutch Maiden, the national personification of the Dutch Republic. My research focuses on a lot of alternative history and usually that involves diving into old maps and coat of arms. Once you've looked at these enough, you begin to notice a theme. They're using these symbols as a way to communicate. To break this down, the lion is the symbol of Venice, but this power is manifesting in one of her corporations, the Dutch Empire, which also manifests in the Dutch East India Company. You will see these symbols everywhere. This is crucial to take note of. The maiden symbol is even more telling. She is typically depicted wearing a Roman or Venetian garment and with a lion by her side. This is telling you that the Dutch were doing the dirty work for the Vatican, but it wasn't just the Dutch, it was all of Europe and spreading quickly both west and east. Just look at this heraldry. Are we supposed to believe that these were all just independent nations? And after all, the Vatican did rule all of Europe for 1500 years. Why can't we ask if it ever ended? But there is one that I want you to look at that you must not forget as it is essential to understanding my point for later in the video. Look at this coat of arms. Notice, two griffins holding up a knight's helmet. You will see this in many coat of arms. But why is this in the Book of Hours from the early 1500s? This is what is referred to as the Headless Knight. It's a royal symbol and it refers to the Hidden Rulers, which are the ancient Phoenician families with their power center being Venice and Rome. A common theme as you will see later in this video is that when the wealthy move to another city, they bring all their buddies and they essentially get another corporation started. In fact, there are several similarities between Venice and Amsterdam. These were the urban elites of Europe, and anyone with a study of world history know this to be true. Amsterdam is literally called the Venice of the North. Both the Netherlands and Italy were both having a renaissance period during this time in the early 16th century. There's also this interesting read comparing the culture between Venice and Amsterdam. I'll leave the reference in the description, but essentially, the elite of Venice were moving operations to places like Leiden University, where if we look at the coat of arms, you can see who owns it. Now, I could continue to show you the similarities and connections, but I honestly think it's its own video, and the coat of arms of all these nations should be the proof you need, but if you want more, let's move on to the Dutch East India Company. This is another very important history we must understand if we're going to see the connection later on. After this Dutch Golden Age, which was because they merged with what was happening in Italy, eventually, the official United East India Company was started in 1602. We are told as a simple charter company for spices, but what this was simply was the first ever international global supply chain that created the biggest company that ever existed in recorded history. This again is its own video, but essentially this is the first global company, the start of global capitalism, and you don't think the wealthy elite at the time had their hands in this? Supposedly, this company are the same people who moved around all the slaves from Africa to America. They tell us millions. Imagine how much money we're talking about here. They weren't merchants. This was literally a military power. Government. And it was even an agricultural producer. You could call it an entire entity of its own. Obviously, with it being a corporation. But... 
There's a dark history behind this company and it involves population resets, taking control of industry behind the scenes, and moving people into newly renovated old world cities. To give you a perspective on how rich this company really was, which again, was its own entity and country, they were worth more than Apple, Google, and Facebook combined, 7.8 trillion being the first supposed global capitalism. Right, they dominated the free market. Still, this number means nothing because you have to understand how much money was in circulation back then. It doesn't mean the same now. So they were even richer than that. You don't think there's something else going on with that story? Let me give you a hint. Whenever you want to know what's going on with who is in control behind the scenes, just type in coat of arms. Why is there a headless knight, a lion as a mermaid Phoenician symbolism, a Florida de lis and an upside down pentagram? Why is that their coat of arms? You have to understand that symbols are everything to these elite. That will be one of our biggest tools in this journey. The first Van de Bilt. Okay, so now let's try to trace down the first Vanderbilt. Now what we need to know is that before New York was New York, it was New Netherlands. For some reason, they don't really teach about this in school or really any of the biographies. But the New Netherlands were a colony of the Dutch West India Company. It wasn't just New York. It was essentially the entire east coast of the United States. That is important to note for later. It was conceived by the Dutch West India Company. The confusing part is that they separated Dutch West and East into two separate companies for some reason, but they are the same entity. Remember, I told you that they were like a country. So at this time, they say the early 1600s, they began their own country in America called New Netherlands. What we do know is that early Vanderbilts were a part of aristocratic New York clubs such as the Holland Society. Here is what the Holland Society of New York has to say. Quote, In 1609, Englishman Henry Hudson sailed for the third time to the Western Hemisphere looking for a shortcut to Asia under the employ of the Dutch East India Company. He sailed into what is now New York Harbor on his famous boat Del Have Maine, in search of profitable ventures in the new world, and to restrain the influences of rival nations, associations of Dutch merchants and traders followed Hudson to America. The former colonization began about 1623. The area was called New Netherland and remained under Dutch rule for 40 years, even though the Dutch relinquished their rule to the English in 1664 and again in 1675. A half century of their heritage lived among its settlers. Their custom and traditions contributed to the new American culture and continues to be observed today." End quote. So there you go. This company, which was the biggest company at its time, would hire new explorers to search for, quote, profitable ventures. Hmm, I wonder what that means. Maybe it involves stealing other lands? Are we to question whether there were already inhabitants in these areas during these times? The first Vanderbilt that history will give us is Jan Artson van der Bilt, a property owner in Long Island. It seems that his name is somewhat of a spelling error, as in many records they would shorten words and so experts seem to agree that their family origin is the little town of Bilt in Holland. But there's more. I found Hetbilt or Hedbilt, which is an older municipality or district of the Netherlands. Built is also a conservative Hollandic dialect which is spoken here. If you search De Bilt, there's some info. The built houses are the headquarters to the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute. Quote, it is the ancestral home and namesake for the prominent Vanderbilt family of the United States. End quote. So we know they're Dutch and they come from Holland. We're also going to cover many techniques or tricks, you could say, that the biographers play when it comes to recounting the histories of these robber baron celebrities. One reoccurring theme seen with the Vanderbilts is to constantly find a way to explain their mass fortune of wealth. 
with many few truly dissecting the story in a critical way that questions their origins. They say they always from the beginning had big families, which is understandable, but they use this as a way to explain their wealth as if each family member was constantly contributing to each other's businesses. As I was doing research for this, at some point there was a switch to English rule, but supposedly it affected them very little. In order to go any further, we have to learn more about New Netherland, which, let me ask you, did you really know about that? And if you did be modest, how many people do you think know about this? Not too many, but this was New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Connecticut, with small outposts in Pennsylvania and Rhode Island. But as we'll soon see, this was far larger. They are underplaying the importance of this colony in history, and you don't think it has anything to do with the Dutch West East India Company? They had $7.8 trillion. Let's remember that. They were there for 50 years, they tell us, possibly even more. 200 years. What do you think they could do in that time? Well, history tells us that when they first arrived, that progress was slow because there were issues with the natives. Hmm, I wonder what that means. They say the population consisted of European colonists, Native Americans, and Africans who were imported. Another colony you probably didn't know about is New Sweden. The same founder of the Dutch West India Company started the Swedish South Company. So as you can see, this was a large project with multiple different countries, corporations involved. Also, New France, New England, and there was Nova Belgica. They try to tell you that it was just a colony from Canada, Virginia. It was not. What do you think would be stopping the largest company in the world? You also have to consider how much land the English had in 1750, as this was essentially still New Netherlands. There was a seamless switch in power. I'm saying that they're one and the same, so yes, it was the entire East Coast. Actually, it was more. So essentially, the early beginnings that were told about Virginia and Jamestown are highly distorted. This has been in operation for a while, and there are still things that do not add up when you question further. We also have to mention how the same thing was happening with New France and New Spain. They all had their own territories or colonies that they were finding. Notice how it's called founded when a colony is started. That is because what we're seeing here is a multi-level operation coordinated by a single hand. The proof is within the coat of arms. What proof do you have that these people were truly fighting in a war with each other? The historical accounts from authorities themselves? Also, notice for some reason that there are these quotes, unclaimed lands. Why would they just stop exploring in such specific areas? They were all in cahoots. They just have to make it seem like all these different corporations were trying to fight for power. Remember, that's the illusion of big business. This was the biggest business at that time. This was Venice, the Lion, the Fleur de Lis, which really is just a decorative sword. They all share the same ruler. Now, skeptics say, what proof do you have of this? You must begin your research and ask the same questions. Resources will be provided. But do you really think the people that tell us our history are just going to hold our hands and explain every single detail? No. They'll tell you what they want you to hear and inform their brothers within their heraldry. This was multiple projects, and they could have been competing like against each other as different ventures. Like when a crazy tycoon starts multiple business projects under different names. You see this in movies all the time. That is what these different countries were. Spain, Britain, France, Netherlands. But who owned them? So essentially, the true origin cannot be trusted when it comes to these biographies. We'll be presenting an alternative soon, but first we must continue so that you can see how this all connects in just a moment. The story picks up with Jacob Vanderbilt, who is a supposed grandson of Jan Artson, and when he got married, his grandpa just gave him a hundred acres of land I guess. This was early Staten Island when it was known as New Dorp. They constantly like to mention that 
This was just a bunch of farmers at this time, just doing what they could. Yeah, for who? Who were they selling to? Hmm, I wonder, were they workers of the Dutch East India Company? I would think so, since the entire country was founded by them, so they were the kings. The founders of the company, they own all the farmland. One thing that I found very interesting when looking up the Vanderbilts was this connection to the Moravian Brethren, a German evangelical sect which came from the Bohemian Protestant martyr John Huss of the early 15th century. Bohemia is another Roman-created corporation. Again, why do all these countries have the same coat of arms? How are we not to conclude that they were all under one rule? Why is this lion everywhere? The double-headed phoenix? The headless knight? I know these symbols. These are all the same people. There's so much that is confusing about this history, such as duplicate names of people, weird religious names as if it's symbolism, and just very strange things in general. The first thing is that they're basically saying that they were just having babies like crazy, and that they were very specific about marriage. They would only marry the higher class people of the town, such as legislators, and in some cases, they intermarried with first cousins. So, this was a very tight-knit group. Another weird thing is that they would just randomly pick up the story when telling us this genealogy, and so now we're at Jacob Vanderbilt II and he married a Mary. Then they have children, the seventh being Cornelius, but this is not the Commodore yet. This is the father who supposedly had a ferry service, so he was into boats as well, and he would just transport a few passengers here and there, but again, they're setting up the narrative. This Cornelius then married Phoebe, which I think there's something to that name that is weird, but she was higher class than Cornelius because her grandfather was a clergyman and her uncle was a general. Phoebe is the mother of the Commodore. They say that the family lost their money after getting married because they lost money investing in continental bonds or something, but they end up having nine children, and this is when we get to the real beginning. The Commodore. Cornelius Vanderbilt was born from Cornelius and Phoebe, and he was the fourth born child. It is said he was born on a port in Kill Van Cole, a Dutch named Strait in the area. So this is where we get to the story. The story's all set up now. The father Cornelius basically failed after the revolution, which I think that may be a symbol, but they tell us that the first Cornelius was basically a failure in farming and ferrying. They call the second Cornelius Cornell, who became the eldest son when his brother Jacob died. Another Jacob, of course. One thing that is really strange is that they make emphasis on how Cornell, or Cornelius Vanderbilt, was illiterate and he was okay with it. He was hostile towards any type of learning environment, is what they say. Now, of course, they are saved by the historians because what they say is that this is one of the strategies, of course, for tricking other business competitors. Yeah, right. Why was he thinking like this from the beginning of his life? He was a very rude person. Throughout his life, he's described as being harsh, rash, and completely irrational. And as we'll soon see, this seems to be accurate. So the story goes, and I'm sure some of you have heard this, but you're gonna have to try and look at this with new eyes now that we know what we know. His mother gives him $100 and he goes to get a pita agua, basically a little boat, because I don't think he's doing anything bigger than that by himself. And if you type pita agua, this is what it looks like, which was considered to be a clumsy sailboat. So at 16, he just takes off giving people little rides in this thing. And let's remember that $100 is like 2,500, maybe even more. So his mom just bought him a car at 16 and he was illiterate, is that right? All he had to do was promise that he would clear some acres of farmland or something. Sounds like they just wanted to give him property as well. They paint him as such a skillful and strong man. He could do the piragua all by himself, and he just went and made a humble living doing the job. Weirdly, Cornelius did special services for the War of 1812, so that means he was transporting troops in this little thing? Was he connected to the state? Well, let's see. So they also mention that Cornelius like swore all the time, so they portray him as this really just 
down from the streets kind of guy that didn't really care about what anyone thought of him. He was just going to beat up anyone who got in his way, and he would literally get into many fist fights in an early age. In 19, he marries Sophia Johnson in 1813. Really, they were born in the exact same location, and she had a huge family because, um, she was his cousin. It is said that Sophia is to have had a deep connection with Phoebe. I find that all very strange, but let's continue. Okay, so that's his beginning. Now we pick up again, and now, all of a sudden, he is known as, quote, the most reliable boatman in New York City. Well, wait, what? We're going to need more explanation on that. No, they say that now he's all of a sudden building schooners and operating on the, hmm, would you look at that, Hudson River. What do we know now about the Dutch origins of the Hudson River? Anyhow, he would transport passengers, cargo, fish, and fruit that he just, you know, he was a hard worker. And so he would even just move his entire supply on shore all by himself. Now we get to the steamboats. This could be its own video, but we must cover it in this chapter as it is deeply integrated with the Vanderbilts. They tell us in mainstream history that Robert Fulton created the first steamboat and that the first steam engine is created by Thomas Newcomen in 1712. Newcomen. Want to hear something interesting? Type in Newcomen coat of arms. You begin to see all these coat of arms in family crest, all with the same symbols. Now at first I thought this was just something with like digital stores where they would just paste old names on coat of arms for whatever reason and you know people wanted to look it up and have a cool way to get a print or something but no listen to this quote started as a way to identify quote units on the battlefield most were family or clan related or at least under the command of a family huh so they had their own family crest and on new common street on london you can again see all the royal family symbols. I don't trust the story of steam engines. No, not at all, especially since they had the technology even in mainstream history for over 2,000 years, such as with the alio pile, yet they didn't do anything with it until some Americans just gave it a shot in the early 1700s. Right, and you don't think the biggest company in the world at the time wasn't going to want to have anything to do with it? You don't think higher elites would want to keep certain technologies from the public? Okay, so let me get this straight. So it's okay for you to believe that UFOs are some secret, but you don't think the governments in the past were keeping certain technologies behind the curtain? No, this is what they don't tell you. The steamboats were not new at this time, but they want to play it as if the steamboats were just some early technology and people just laughed at them because they were these small little things that made all this noise and they really just didn't compare when it comes to these large sailboats that quietly made their course or that's what they want us to believe as now comes the perfect opportunity to present this technology to the public so all the waters and steamboat paths were owned by thomas fulton at the time through his connection with what's known as the livingston clan or really just a bunch of legislators they basically got control of these areas for a short period of time. Supposedly, the Union line of steamboats were not too happy with this decision, so they got it reversed. Which is weird, supposedly this guy Thomas Gibbons, who did the Union line from New York to Philly, helped get a law going that would put any officer in state prison for trying to arrest a citizen for steamboating in New Jersey. I have to mention this guy because he basically hires Cornelius, and they never really explain how they met or anything. Only that, he just started working for Thomas in 1818. So, Cornelius became the pilot of a little steamer called Mouse of the Mountain for a thousand a year salary. So that's like 25k a year, which seems right, but just weird. I mean, wasn't he the most reliable boatman? So, wasn't he like already famous enough to get like a better position at least? But anyways, the reason that Thomas Gibbons liked Cornelius is that he was, quote, skillful at avoiding writs. 
So basically, he got around doing taxes, which we'll see this reference a lot. Basically, he was so skilled at avoiding taxes, Thomas gave him an even bigger boat, the Bologna, which Cornelius had a little secret chamber where he could hide in, I guess, to get away from inspection. Now, I don't really buy the whole tax avoiding thing because as we'll see, if he was really a hard-working laborer that made his way into the business world, other tycoons at the time would have seen it and shut down the competition. Even the state would have said something. But for some reason, they just are allowing him to get away with these massive tax breaks. It also kind of debunks his whole being legitimate and his way to riches. Which is strange because this is one of the main reasons he gets all his wealth. But anyways, while this is all happening, they tell us that he also had time to take over the management of a dilapidated hotel in New Brunswick called Bologna Hall. He dropped off his own passengers from the trip, so that's fishy, but get this. He puts Sophie in charge of the place, and I guess she fixed it all up and operated the whole thing while birthing 13 children? 13 children? I mean, that's more than a dozen, guys. Just think about that, and he was making only 20000 a year. They tell you this because they have to give you other ventures he was in to explain how he became so successful. Now the story picks up and it's 1829. Almost a decade passes by. Now supposedly, Cornelius had enough money from his job with Thomas and the inn to basically quit the union line and he moved his family to New York City. Now, this doesn't really make sense. And I do think the burden of proof is on these people recounting the story to us. Now, out of nowhere, he somehow has the money to build multiple of his own steamboats. There is no explanation for this, but eventually, he had more than a hundred boats and became known as the King of Long Island. Well, the explanation is that he was just a hard-working businessman. But like I said, that is the mainstream narrative. Why should we just accept blindly what we're told by the media and historians that represent these people? But not only did he have hundreds of steamboats, he was also creating better service than anyone else at that time, creating larger steamboats that were more fashionable, yet they were cheaper and he outbeat all of his competitors. Wait, how? I thought he didn't even go to school. How is he just defeating all of the other businesses at the time? You will see throughout the story, the Vanderbilts will do whatever they can to get rid of their competition, even though that involved lowering their prices. The truth is, this scheme would never have worked. He would have had growing costs as they expanded. There's no way he could afford it by undercutting everyone else and innovating new and creative features such as more comfortable cabins. Not only that, but he for some reason never decided to insure any of his boats. They say this is the reason that made him so successful, that he just rather focus on good service and good captains, rather than have anything insured. Seems like he was carefree if you ask me. He made a lot of money during the time between 1829 and 1850. He made over 30,000 a year, which equals a million a year. And again, this isn't an accurate conversion as this already made him one of the richest New Yorkers. So. That would more accurately be even more money once you consider the amount of money in circulation. So, he is now one of the wealthiest New York elite. That's the first stage of the story. The steamboat famous Staten Island story is what we'll call it. Interestingly, monitoring the lives of rich people was super popular back then, kind of like today. That's why we should really just call them celebrities. One of their supporters in the media Moses Yale Beach, another figure that history tells us about involving this guy who was the inventor of the Associated Press. Meaning, this was literally the guy who started news in America. This was also the founder of multiple New York publishers, the first being The Sun. He said that Cornelius had half a million dollars. And honestly, I'm not going to keep repeating myself when it comes to these inflation calculators. I don't trust this at all when we're talking about large amounts of money. But the mainstream says this is 16 million, which made him one of the richest men in New York. So now, we get to why he's called the Commodore. Well, it's supposed to be because he was skilled at being a captain. 
But wait. He was just skilled at avoiding taxes if I remember, and he was strong, but how did he become the best captain in the world? He wasn't trained or anything that we are told of, but supposedly this just means naval commander. Hmm, so he was a commander, or in other words, an officer in Old Dutch. A commander for who? Supposedly, they were rich, but they were living in cramped and lowly living conditions, whatever that means. So they decided to move back to Staten Island, only because Phoebe the mother decided it was best to go there being their homeland and all. The story goes, now he's going to go and build a farm. I don't remember him getting any training in buildings or even agriculture, but okay, they built a farm between Stapleton and Tompkinsville. This is crazy. Whether you believe in Tartaria or not, this is proof of old world architecture being converted into modern buildings. Here's a picture of what this home in Stapleton looked like. Okay, so their first supposed home that they just decided to build and construct, and guess what? The architect is unknown, surprise, surprise. But this was a million dollar mansion. They say, probably even more. Remember, this was 40 feet tall, the ceilings on each floor were 12 feet tall, and the rooms were, quote, very large. And this is their first piece of architecture which is the first building or mansion that we know of that was supposedly built by these Vanderbilts. And, quote, it had a modified Gothic style with Grecian portico and six enormous fluted columns. Here, Cornelius indulged in his three pleasures, good whiskey, cigars, and horses. Yeah, right. Okay, where did he get the inspiration behind this? Go read the biographies. Not one of them is going to explain how he went from ignorant, cursing, fist-fighting, small fairy boy who then somehow became the wealthiest man in New York with a taste for classical architecture. And you guys aren't going to take the time to explain how that happens? Look at what it is today. It's just a Chinese restaurant, and look how drastically different it looks. This is what's happening with all these ruins in downtowns. They are renovated old world buildings that have been modified for new businesses. This is just one example that doesn't even require you to believe in Tartaria. This really happened and look how much it was modified. Now of course, this is if you believe the mainstream narrative. But, just look at it. Old world, new world. Again, you will have to bear in with me. I'm just asking questions. So I'm assuming their whole family was living here, and very soon, the Commodore had children and they were having husbands that the Commodore would then get jobs to basically everyone in the family, which seems to me just a family tradition from their ancestry. He was very stern, and would really just ignore most of his children. He basically hated the one who was named after him, Cornelius Jeremiah. So. I guess this guy was addicted to gambling and was just a failure and so his father called him a weakling and then Cornelius Jeremiah ran away to California somehow, but then he was arrested on orders of his father and brought to guess where? Bloomingdale Asylum for the Insane. This seems to be the Commodore's main method for dealing with his family problems. Now his other son, William Henry, the Commodore saw somewhat of a chance in him. but. He was still constantly in bad health, and so the Commodore would always make him feel bad because of it. And also, he himself never really got sick for some reason. So, William Henry was skilled at lending money, I guess, meaning he worked in the banks, and his father gave him an allowance because he was his favorite. Well, William Henry had supporters like Horace Greeley at the New York Tribune. They were deeply connected with the press, as I mentioned earlier. Okay. So here we go, notice how we haven't mentioned Dutch in a while. It's because the story really doesn't want to emphasize it that much. But William Henry marries Maria Louisa Kiesum, the daughter of a pastor of the reformed Dutch church. Again, another prominent member. So I guess William got into writing business letters or I don't know, they really don't really explain it. But that he gets really ill and this just really pisses off the Commodore. So William gets exiled from New York and had to stay in Staten Island. These parents controlled every move of their children. 
William Henry becomes a farmer, and this is another weird thing connecting to the last video if you haven't seen it, but basically, the soil on Staten Island was horrible, so they had to import horse poop from Manhattan in order to fertilize the soil. They never actually say it's horse poop, all they say it's fertilizer. Whatever that means. So William starts his own farm with all this new soil and his dad is like, oh wow, this is impressive son. I guess the Commodore was starting to be interested in horse railways all of a sudden and he just decided, you know what, I'm going to buy all this from my son and just use it for the street railways, right? trying to act like they went their separate ways and the father was just impressed so they made a deal with each other but William earned the Commodore's respect because he somehow got the better of the situation. What are you talking about? He's your father. He's the richest dude in New York. Of course he has the upper hand. He gives you allowance. This is just another Commodore business but okay. They decide let's fix the Staten Island railroad system because supposedly at the time it had no money in it or it was in horrible condition. They tell us that this was just 13 miles and it was in horrible shape and all this stuff, but that can mean there were only 13 miles of usable tracks. Again, I think everything is up for question, even the history of these railroads which they tell us about. For example, they say from 1863 and 1869, so in less than six years, they built 2,000 miles of railroad across the US. Not only that, but there's evidence of railroad tracks being in America from the 1700s in Nova Scotia. This is not a new technology. Quote, from the years 1839 to 1842, he was a banking business as a clerk. This is of course William Henry. When he started, his salary was 150,000 per annum. In the second year, it increased to 300,000 per year. Later in the years, William's father decided to purchase his son a farm located at New Dorp. The farm was 75 acres and located between the Moravian Church and the area. Hmm. The farm was not so big and had to be carefully taken care of and fertilized so they were able to grow crops. There was an outcome of success with the farming. William followed his father's success in lives by the motto of hard work during the day and rest in the night. During this time, his father had exerted more control over the Long Island Railroad. William was called to reorganize the ailing organization, just like he did on the farm, he was able to turn the business into a thriving operation, making him a public figure in the family's railroad empire, just like his dad." End quote. In 1855, he lived in this old world looking house near Stapleton that they never say whether they built or not, I'm not sure, but it looks interesting to me. In 1860, the Staten Island Railroad became William's focus. He was an appointed receiver. In 1865, he had become the vice president of the Hudson River Railway. There goes the Hudson again. In 1869, he became the vice president of the New York and Hudson River Railway. But how? Because of his father? Or did he do this all on his own? Okay, so now the Commodore is reaching the end of his life. His son has now helped him amass even more fortune. Now he's ready for his newest venture, but he needed investments. And supposedly these biographers like to paint it as if, oh, this was the first time since he got that $100 investment from his mother for the Biragua. And now this would be the first time he started looking for investors. Okay, guess what he does? He goes to England, his first trip ever outside the country supposedly, and he goes to the Rothschilds and asks them for help. Okay, but the story goes, right, that the Rothschilds decided that they would not invest without a first-hand report of the possibilities of a route. So supposedly, the Commodore just decided, nah, I'll show them, I'll do it on my own. Or at least that's what the biographers tell us. I forgot to mention, but one of the Commodore's first steamboats that he built for himself was named after him, and I wanted to show you a picture of what it looked like. Supposedly, it was designed by him, they tell us. Oh yeah? With what expertise? Look how massive this is. This is like 1847. So in 1850, he had another ship called Prometheus, which, again, you'll see this theme, all of his boats have weird names. The first one is called Bolana, 
which is eerily similar to Leo Belgicus. It's just a different spelling. Bellana, Belliona. But anyways, now we have Prometheus, the Lightbringer. He goes and basically takes over the Nicaraguan government and somehow getting permission to establish an entirely new business in their waters and they were just cool with it. This was a 9 day trip from New York to Greytown, which was an extremely overcomplicated route that many say was literally unnavigable or at least this is what everyone believed. So it was from New York to Greytown, then they would get transferred to Central America, then from there they were taking up the coast to California. This is what they say was his new business venture. It was called, quote, New and Independent Line for California via Nicaragua. They brought over thousands of people who wanted to join in on the gold rush, but you really gotta think, why would the richest man in America right now, why would he want to get people to come into California and find gold? Why wouldn't he just go there in private and hire men to get all the gold himself? Is it because there is something else going on with this whole gold rush story? Maybe it's because they were repopulating these newly conquered areas and this was a repopulation event. Not a business venture offering low affordable transport across the United States. If they were really selling a gold rush experience, that ticket would be so expensive. Who's going to pay for such a long trip like that wanting to get into the gold rush? Poor families looking for the lottery? How do they have the money for such a trip? Yet they tell us thousands of people took this trip and came to California. There are also terrible steamboat tragedies, including one event that almost killed 200 passengers. So, after making a profit on that, he sells all his shares and then truly becomes one of the wealthiest people in the world. You don't think that would garner any attention? After his shares were bought, he had 11 million they tell us in 1853 which is worth almost a trillion dollars already, maybe half a trillion, but like I said, this whole conversion process is messed up. Okay, so now we get to a really weird story. During this time, he decides that it's time for a European vacation with all of his family, so he builds a special ship for this called the North Star. Okay, this was an ocean steamboat yacht, and it was the largest to ever be built for a private individual, weight of total 2,500 tons. The amenities were beyond glorious. Family staterooms, each decorated in different color combinations. Green and gold, or crimson and gold for example. Berths were put with these massive heavy lace curtains. Now, I'm not sure why people believe this as there is no evidence that this yacht existed to my knowledge. All I could find were engravings and models, but after World War I, it was supposedly given to the British and Canadian governments. So anyways, they get the family together and leave some members out for whatever reason, and they're ready to set sail, but some firemen are like, we want higher wages, and the Commodore just says nope, and fires them, and then hires new people or something. I don't know, I thought he believes in hard laborers, but he's like a prince now, so he doesn't have time for arguing. Mainstream history tells us that they left Staten Island and made it to Southampton, England in less than 10 days which was an extremely fast time, maybe even a record for its time period, especially for a newly constructed yacht. They tell us that when they arrived, the British were just clueless to what was going on. A confused reporter from the London Daily News said, quote, He has come by train from Southampton and left his private yacht in the dock at the port. It's a monster streamer, and they basically describe it as being more magnificent than the Queen's yacht. I can't really believe this event because that would just be seen as disrespect. But no, they were invited to a soiree at the Lord Mayor of London's mansion house. They went, but the Commodore refused to make a speech. He was known for never speaking in public. Did you hear that? He was antisocial and refused to make any type of public appearances. That's important to note. Then the family set sail to St. Petersburg, and they hung out with the Grand Duke Constantine, an admiral of the Russian royalty. The story goes that this was the Commodore's first meeting with any type of royalty. Mm hmm. No connection with any of these people at all, and they're just so impressed with this American. And you know what? They even saw them as equals. That's what the biographies say, I'm not even kidding. 
they visited a variety of Italian cities, another important part of their trip, in which they visited Florence, where they seemed to have had a meeting with the sculptor Hiram Powers. They stopped shortly in Constantinople and returned to America, but the story says that they covered over 15,000 miles in only 58 days, or less than two months. Another common thing that you'll see is that there aren't too many of these expensive Gilded Age steamboat yachts. You would think that we would have hundreds preserved, but no, that's not the case. They tell us that there were 11,000 steamboats in America. That's not even considering the world, but supposedly only five remain and they're built after the 1900s. So, after his luxurious trip meeting with dukes and queens, he basically gets into a dispute with the accessory transit company. Something to do with interest, but instead of suing them, the biographies say he took Vanderbiltian measures. He is quoted saying, quote, The law is too slow. I will ruin you. End quote. Then, I mean, we all know the story. He made them bankrupt by blocking their routes. Um, and this is the guy. So we're supposed to trust this guy. He then sold his New York to California shipping line and made a lot of money around 20 million, but most of it came from his ability to manipulate his stock. Okay, so the story picks up again, and now they're living in a townhouse in Manhattan because the Commodore is super focused on business, but Sophia's like, I don't like New York, I want to move back to Staten Island. But the Commodore says, how dare you question me and sends her back to the asylum. Also, in every one of these cases, it's always other people that come to the rescue of these family members. In this case, Sophia was saved by her mother-in-law, Phoebe, which was one of the last deeds before she died. Remember what I said about their connection. She was then buried in the Moravian Cemetery in Staten Island. Why? There's no mention on why they're still connected with the Moravians. Isn't he just a hard-working businessman who started from the ferry business? What is his association with the Moravians? This also connects with the Astors, which is its own story, but they're all descended from these same royal families. I can keep going, there is more, but to finish off the history of the Commodore, his final moves were essentially the railroads. There's an interesting story behind this. Supposedly, he was hesitant to get started or something because he was in an accident 30 years prior where he almost died and punctured a lung. Not sure about that, but okay. They basically want you to think that, oh, he was hesitant. He was scared of big old bad trains that he's still being illiterate referred to as, quote, those things that go on land, end quote. So I guess he didn't even refer to them as trains, and he was afraid of them. But eventually, he conquers his fears, and then he just started becoming an investor in small individual railroads from different cities. Slowly but surely, creating his monopoly so that he could connect all of them to create an everlasting transportation empire. Hmm, doesn't that sound familiar? Before that, he supposedly accomplished that vision through mass manipulation of his stocks, and with all this money at age 70 now, it's still not done, which, by the way, there's only one photo of this guy taken in the Civil War, they say, but now he has control all of New York, Harlem, and Hudson Line, and then he went for the New York Central Railroad. His final big move was continuing to expand with New York to Chicago. This new conglomerate revolutionized rail operations by standardizing procedures and timetables, increasing efficiency, and decreasing travel and shipment times. Or at least, that's what they want us to hear. They tell us that out of nowhere, the Commodore became interested in the occult, and after Sophia's death, he sought the help of the Chaplin sisters, two mediums that could allow him to communicate with her. He ended up just thinking they were fakes. However, this is actually how he met his second wife, their distant cousin named Frank Armstrong. Okay, so now we're getting into train stations, which this is 1870s, so no pulleys, and they're building these massive brick train stations. Not only that, hold up. He buys all these properties on 42nd Street, which look at this old photo. 
I really can't find too much info on these buildings. If anyone knows more, please do tell, but he basically bought all these properties here and then built the train station and there are barely any photos of this in the process involved. History portrays him as a philanthropist at the end of his life, just giving away most of his wealth to charity is what they tell us. Huh, right, like Vanderbilt University? Look at this place. They say it was founded in 1873. After he just randomly donated $1 million to a Methodist bishop in Tennessee. Hmm, do I sense a Moravian connection again? So in 1876, he became ill, began a eight month death march. A death march? They say he literally yelled at his doctors and he died on January 4th, 1877, leaving his massive estate almost worth a hundred million over to William Henry, which we learned about earlier. Now, when it comes to his estate, we're going to cover this in a later section, since for some reason, it's glossed over in the main biographies. But this money was basically split up between the whole family. And then, that's the end of the Commodore. Asheville Underground and the New York Connection. We continue by moving right into Asheville, as this is deeply connected with this whole story. Yet, this connection is only really known by locals. So Asheville is a city in North Carolina. Asheville, which is what they call a boom town, or one of the most well-preserved America boom cities, or at least that's what they want you to think because I have some serious questions. But before that, let's read this history because it really did not get started until 1880. Before then, it was just a small town in mainstream history. It started as Cherokee Nation, which they have many legends of giants too, as mentioned in previous videos. But then the first town of Asheville was named Morristown. Travelers came and made trails and stuff, but there was really nothing going on yet. That all changed when the elite from New York came rushing in during the 1880s, so they tell us, and just started building all of Asheville in like 20 years. To put it into perspective, there was less than 10,000 residents, probably even fewer in 1890. Yet, they start building all these massive brick buildings and palaces, and these are no easy feat. Alright, for example, let's just look at the Freemason building. They say this was built in 1909. People pass it every day, never asking or questioning this narrative, but there are many buildings just like this that I could show you as we've been here and walked around and seen all the buildings. But let me tell you what I think is the best evidence behind there being something else going on with Asheville. Underground Asheville. Explain why buildings are going completely underground, several feet underground level. This became apparent as this is actually in all the stores or most of them. Go visit downtown. And in many of these buildings, they have stairs that go down to the basement where there's more area, right? And you can clearly see that this is a lower level of an older building. So let's explore this idea. Now, we have to understand that these theories that we're going to deal with, they revolve around this topic of trust because remember, this whole video is a journey of someone who doubts the mainstream narrative. So this is all about what information should we trust, which information is a cover up and so on. So what you will see with these underground sections of the city is that they've been labeled as some prohibition scheme where they dug down or something and created these passageways for selling in secret. I don't buy that story at all, but okay, let's start with that. Underground Tunnels is tonight's Ask 13. News 13's Frank Fraboni is with us. And Frank, could there be truth to the rumors? Well, Tammy, the questions about a network of underground tunnels in Asheville have been around for years. This one came from Josh Settle, who asked, why are there entrances to tunnels under Asheville, and what were those tunnels used for? Could Asheville be keeping dark secrets deep underground? This is the Sanborn maps. At the old Buncombe County Genealogical Society. Now, you can tell from the map, 
insurance maps from 1925 do show a tunnel. And that is an underground tunnel. That tunnel below Wall Street is commonly known as Rat Alley, a service entrance for businesses on Patton Avenue. This is a, 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 a connector to a, a network of tunnels underneath the city of Asheville. But Tom Israel believes it may have been connected to this. And there are other entry points into this tunnel system throughout downtown. Some still exist, some don't. Israel and his family are owners of Pack Tavern on Spruce Street. They discovered the double locking steel doors during renovations and are certain this was used during prohibition. We understand that um, they, uh, they would store uh, liquor uh, in this building during that period and uh, use this tunnel system to distribute it. The old Hayes Hobson building was first built in 1907 and was originally a lumber supply company. Let's see. Sanborn maps do not show any of the underground network other than Rat Alley, but many in town remember the stairways to underground restrooms at Pack Square. This photo from 1929 and another from the 60s when they were later segregated. And I know the access to those subsurface restrooms were also an access point to this tunnel system. Asheville City Plan. A book in the UNCA Special Collections Library. We have suggested that a tunnel or subway be built. By author John Nolan did suggest going underground, but the city plan published in 1922 makes no mention of the network. Historians say that would make sense if the tunnels were used for the illegal liquor trade. You probably would not let people know about those tunnels. The brick arch is very inter an interesting. Unlocking Asheville's underground past. So at some point in time, it, it was blocked off. Closing the door on the city's secret tunnels. Okay, so again, that's the mainstream story. And notice how he said all over downtown. Oh, really? And are you guys leaving out any information? How many of you are from Asheville? Some locals know this, but there used to be a subway in Asheville. This is some very deep stuff. It's hard to find information on this, but they just say it was an abandoned project, right? I don't believe them. They had these entrances all over town. And supposedly this was purposely blocked up by the officials. The Flatiron Building features a deep basement, which seems to be one of the stops connected to this tunnel system. Remember, this was covered up by these wealthy families in the early 1900s, and over time, their connections and whatnot took over the city becoming the local officials. This stuff is not easily accessible, and you are most likely to hear it from a local legend, but no one knows the answer. It's almost as if it's lingering on everyone's mind, but no one knows, so we just all accept the mainstream history. But deep down, we know that there has to be something more. There have been rumors of there being secret passages beneath the Masonic Temple since its supposed construction in 1915. This is a well-known legend and eventually, a paranormal investigator went to investigate with thermal sensors and he did indicate where a tunnel would be near their own private bowling alley but it would require excavation, which the members won't allow. So now it's basically blocked off because so many people tried to go see it. The local historians are just a bunch of skeptics, saying that no, these are just a few tunnels, prohibitions, blah, blah, blah. Man, these historians have no clue how to think. They just read the books and they have rote memory. That's not thinking. That's not comparative research, that's just mindlessly parodying the mainstream narrative. There's plenty of physical proof that shows multiple underground chambers in Nashville that everyone can see for themselves. Why would there be a door in a basement? Throughout the 20th century, different businesses and their owners would renovate and modify this old building. What did you think the first time you walked in this building? how we're going to do this <laughs> because it really it was cut up into uh, all kinds of small offices but before this it was the uh, city and county parole offices so everybody had an office and uh, all that had to be torn out and got down to the bare minimum it's come a long way since uh, it's when we started this project to become a restaurant today so. It turned out the owners of these old businesses decades ago would not rip out of the old renovations 
They'd simply add layers of construction. Sandblast the original brick. We took up three layers of hardwood floor to get to the original. Literally a hundred years of, I guess, progress rolled back to the original state. Yeah, nature. And the developers didn't realize the significance of what they'd find in the basement and how it would spark their creativity. This just kind of jumped out at us. This, this giant tunnel in the basement made its history clear. The Pax Tavern basement features an old entranceway to a tunnel system that was used to run bootleg liquor underground between downtown Asheville buildings. The entrance features two heavy iron doors. Stuart Coleman gave us a tour. This tunnel here, it had uh, access to a series of tunnels on the other side and it had a double locking mechanism that locked. Um, you lock inside. You lock yourself in and you lock other people out. So these tunnels, were they really a secret to the authorities or were they a secret officially, but everyone knew what was going on down here? Uh, they were not secret because they run even under the Masonic Temple and they run uh, up here in front of the Biltmore Building and they discovered them in the park when they were redoing the vitalization of the park. Uh, there was a series of four tunnels that crossed over each other and they were severed also by utilities. So it's kind of a similar video, but did you hear what that guy said? What would be the implications of there being tunnels that go all the way to the Biltmore? So this is what they tell us. They just built this whole city, which is completely on a hilly landscape with all these interconnected underground tunnel systems, basements with doors, a supposed subway project. How the heck did they do that in 1880 in such a short time period and no one's going to ask any questions? Subterranean levels to a city imply that there are actually the lower level of the building. I know that is not what we're taught, but why else would there be windows and doors in a basement? It's almost unimaginable because the alternative theory is so drastically different from what we have been told in our schools. Our programmed minds trained to react when faced with such cognitive dissonance must label the material as ridiculous, a complete fairy tale. And even though that may be the case, Reality is far stranger than we were led to believe. I don't think we know everything about reality, and we deserve to question what we were taught in mainstream history. Do you believe everything we're told about the robber barons? To be honest, I don't, and I deserve that right. They have the burden of proof, and I'm just not convinced. I see red flags everywhere I look, and now that I look at this whole subject with new eyes, after looking into Tartaria for so long, you can clearly see that this is some type of propaganda to some degree. I think we can all, or a large majority of us, agree on that statement. They were celebrities, right? They were married to state politicians, right? Let's ask these questions as it does seem that many people are beginning to wake up during these times. With that, we go to the final chapter. Biltmore Unveiled. I'm doubtful of the entire mainstream narrative behind the Vanderbilts. I feel I have the right to say that. We went there. Not only did we go there, we went on the high-end tour and I asked every question I could. Now I'm here not to only break down the history of the house, but also to explain my experience, review, and final thoughts. You don't have to believe a word I say. Feel free to go to the mainstream narrative if you want. That's the official story. I'm just going to give my opinion. So William Henry had a 58-room mansion in Manhattan for some reason, and he supposedly funded both Columbia University and the opera in 1883, right? We had all these properties on Fifth Avenue in New York. 
So, when the Commodore died, his entire will and fortune, or most of it, was passed to William Henry. And he too was also old, so he was about to die. So essentially, trillions got transferred over to William's youngest son, George Washington Vanderbilt II. Again, something with all these weird repeating names. So, this is the grandson of the Commodore. Okay, and he's like super young when this all happens. He's a bachelor. They mentioned that many times. What I don't get is that they say the Vanderbilts became known for education, yet they don't explain this since they came from supposed farmers and the Commodore was illiterate and he hated his kids. So who taught these people to be intelligent and lovers of fine art? That is never truly explained. Important to know. So... They just started giving their money away. I guess people just believed they were such nice people. But I don't know about all that. These are just new business ventures. They just learned how to start calling it philanthropy. So now you don't question them. Anyways, George Washington grew up without his father. Yet we're supposed to believe that he just became this quiet yet intelligent young man learning about art on his own, collecting his own collection. Okay, who taught him all this? He just decided to go do this all on his own since he seems he lived in a Manhattan mansion during this period. He was just studying in his room instead of being a New York rich boy. He was a lover of the finer things. Right, and so he eventually, he just inherits this entire mansion and basically they get all these properties on Fifth Avenue. I mean, they had so many buildings and there is no real explanation on how these were made or anything. Many of them were demolished. So they were just blowing money for no reason to build these huge mansions and then just destroy them in less than 10 years. So the story goes, this guy, George Washington Vanderbilt, just read a bunch of books. I don't know where he got them because there's no real mention of his father being into any type of ancient fine art or anything like that. So he just reads some books and starts a collection and then he decides to go visit Asheville, North Carolina for the first time. They actually say this in the mainstream, like they have articles that say, this whole event is shrouded in mystery, as supposedly. This was the first time he had ever visited Asheville. So he went there and just knew that he needed to build his country home here, so the story goes. Okay, so now we're getting into the modern day now, so you have to understand that they've been celebrities for a while now. Technology is advancing, people still treat these people like rock stars, and so you still have journalists trying to be nosy about everything that happens in their lives. They had to be fully aware of this. On January 9th, 1889, the Asheville Citizen featured an article first published by the New York Herald. The report stated, quote, Some months ago, the good people of Asheville were surprised by the presence in that beautiful little city of Charles McName, the New York lawyer, of the well-known firm of Davis Work and McName. Mr. McName entered at once with business-like promptness. Upon the purchase of sundry tracts of land just south of the corporate limits of Asheville, across the Swannanoa River, it was soon surmised from the extent of his purchases that he represented some northern capitalist, and it presently leaked out that his client was none other than George Vanderbilt, the young railroad millionaire. Now, I don't buy the idea that it was just supposed to be a country home. This was planned to be a business from the start. Even others at the time suspected something was up. Quote, January 12, 1889, Headline in the Asheville Citizen read, Still buying land? Mr. Vanderbilt's domain extending in Buncombe. The article went on to report, quote, that Mr. Vanderbilt contemplates purchasing the southern portion of the county is a conjecture that at present disturbing the minds of the people residing in that section of the state of Buncombe. Quote, the purchases still go on, and there's no telling where they will stop. Mr. McName is as active and energetic as ever regarding the acquisition of other tracts to the already large acreage described in these columns before. What Mr. Vanderbilt proposes to do, and how he's going to set out about doing it, are problems we are unable to solve. The reticence of his agent, and the utter ignorance of his wise acres, who pretend to know all about it, 
establishes a veil of mystery into which the reportial eye fails to penetrate. In other words, they were saying, they don't trust this dude, something is sketchy, something's up. And an unnamed source from the Daily Citizen, so this is basically the first news we have of the Biltmore, or um, the first contrived and edited narrative presented by the release, or at least that is what it seems to be as indicated by the locals. But they continue to describe it as if this is a future project to be created. Now, to be honest with you, I think this whole thing was orchestrated even with the critique. Again, we're talking trillion dollar companies as soon will be explained. So he eventually purchases over 125,000 acres of land, which Edith Vanderbilt would later sell off to the government later in her life from what I heard from the guide. I don't think you understand, Disney World and Disneyland combined is a total of 32,000 acres, okay? So Biltmore Estates was once four times this amount in land. Now, I think it's important to be fair here I know what the counter argument is, and I'm going to address it thoroughly. All I ask in return is for you to keep an open mind. I've decided that it is best to present this first before showing my final case, as many may not even be able to get there because I'm sure many of you have been there. I'm sure there are many Asheville locals watching this video right now. I know exactly what I have to address. Now, before we continue with the Biltmore, the first hurdle that we're going to face is the mainstream narrative. They know people are going to have questions. They know they need to have a background story. So, as a guest to the Biltmore, as you enter the estate, there's a guest center that you can sit in and it will explain the entire history of the Biltmore. If you're here to come and inform me of it, trust me, I sat there and I watched it and it felt like pure propaganda. But if you're interested in hearing an alternative, but you also want me to explain the construction photos, well here we go, I'm going over it. So first, we're presented with a set of specifically designed photo shoots of the construction of this building. Now, for the majority of the population, this is enough evidence. Not only is it enough evidence, there are no questions even asked about this building and their family by the vast amount of people who visit it. The main and only counter argument is there are construction photos. Okay, well let's take a look. The first stage is the base stage, where we see an empty land. This is where they got the land ready for the building. Okay, what if I asked the question, is this really the location? I know you may think that's cheap, but please, come on, explain to me why. I don't see how photo manipulation, whether done with the original photos or even digitally, is not even considered for a moment. It almost makes you look like an idiot for even suggesting such a matter. Yet I'm going to bring it up, because I feel it's important to note. Was it possible to Photoshop images in the 1900s? It was, and even earlier since photography's origin. What you could do is take two different negatives from completely different photographs and combine them. Let me show you the proof. The first works on compositing from 1857. Now, compositing is the art of layering images. This is a composite image made almost 200 years ago. Look at this. Sure, you can slightly see where the different layers are, but that's pretty phenomenal for this time period. They tell us they didn't have the technology to take photos of these mansions in 1870s, or there are very few. Yet, they were making advanced artistic composites in 1850? Remember, the Vanderbilts were artists, especially George Washington Vanderbilt. You don't think they knew of this technique? And let me ask you, if you understand what the media does today and the way they manipulate the narrative, even by constraining and limiting what you can see and know, you don't think that was happening in the past? Why not? These are trillionaires. You know what they say? In the next construction photo, you can see them lifting the bottom base which we're going to take a look at in a moment from other angles. But this is what they want you to see. To 
Just a few men in top hats, a few workers, using pulleys, lifting up huge stones and placing them effortlessly. Except, we don't see that process at all. All we see is the stones already laid down, and a highly contrasted image. Don't worry, I'm going to explain even more. I'm not saying anything is just fake, just follow me for one moment. Okay, so, those are the beginning stages. Then, we have the bring up the arches stages, which again, there's no process of. They told us this was all done with just pulley systems, no modern equipment of any kind, and that they would use horses to pull like the really big heavy items. Now, I can see stonemasons thinking this is actually possible, but no, it's not actually possible in this fashion. You know what they say? That George Washington just hired a thousand workers, and these aren't skilled artisans, they were just local labor workers, and they just built this entire structure in six years. Okay, so tell me why this has never been replicated and no one else can even get close to the massiveness of this structure, including the largest basement in America, and as we will soon cover, underground tunnels as was heard in the last chapter. So they built underground tunnels. I didn't hear one thing on the guided tour about this. There were no construction photos of this. Now, I'm not here to tell you these photos are fake. I don't know, but you don't know if they're real. I will go ahead and explain that what most people will find to be the most moderate answer as this was actually built on top of an old world Tartarian structure in this area. Let me show you the base. You can see how the bottom base looks much older than the upper portion. Not only that, these are massive stones. I really don't think they were pulling these up on pulleys, and I don't see why I would, as there's no photos of them doing so. Here is a picture of where the gates are in that whole hill area that overlooks the house. We don't really see any construction photos of this area, and so I guess we have to assume that they were just moving all this dirt, placing the stones, and I mean, it kind of looks pretty old even in these photos. Okay, so we don't even have any construction photos of the building to the right of the Biltmore where the bookstore and the cafe is. There's also an under level section here as well. They'll only show you the construction photo where it's at the scaffolding stage of the building, so it's already done. So yeah, just bear with me as there really is so much to cover including multiple different theories one involving secret tech, so there really isn't nothing to lose. All the information will be provided, and at the end, you can decide for yourself what you want to believe. I still haven't even presented what I believe to be the case yet. Not only did we go on this tour, explore everything that we could, but we went to their own bookshop, we bought their own collection of propaganda for us to read and study along with multiple trips to different libraries in person and online in order to give you this alternative history on the Biltmore. What you have to understand is that if you accept these construction photos as truth, then you have to accept the mainstream narrative. Yes, you have to accept everything they told us about the rubber barons, the Commodore, that weird European vacation, all of it. You have to accept it, including that this family worked their way from poor to rich. That's their main message. It's like the American dream and people just sit there and think about how overly wealthy this family was. But you don't think this could be a part of something bigger? If so, then stay with me as I continue to share what I've learned about the history of the Biltmore and also our experience with going there in person. I mean, bro, I was on the roof. Okay, so what are some weird or even unique things about the Biltmore? Well, of course, the Vanderbilt history, the out of nowhere rush to Asheville seemingly out of nowhere and everyone thought it was strange for the time. The Biltmore was fully supplied with electricity when it was first built, completely running on DC, so it had electricity almost 30 years before others did. It also has the oldest elevator of its kind and it's an original. Now. I asked the guide about the sewage systems, which they weren't even going to cover. They were talking about the bathrooms and how they were originals, which I can believe, but he said there were two things that the Biltmores didn't have. 
AC, and waste management. They used chamber pots and the few bathrooms they had were simply dumped straight into the river. So let me get this straight. George Washington Vanderbilt decides that this is the perfect country home. He's basically going to set up this estate for inviting wealthy New York elites. And then basically, they just dump their shit in nature. And no, it's not for fertilizing. They just had no other method. Yet they can build castles unlike any other workforce in America, and it still can't be replicated today? Remember, 1,000 men with pulleys. Why can't someone today hire that and make it happen? You don't think something was lost? Okay, so they buy all this land, build this estate. Remember how much land this was? You really think this is just a country home purchase? Which I think it's obviously even from a mainstream historical point of view that this was set up to be some type of a lodge and nature resort for a wealthy elite. But get this, after all this effort, it actually failed. This whole idea was not a successful venture at first, and in fact, the only thing that kept it afloat was the dairy farm. Fun little fact that I learned as I was getting the water from the cafe. The tour guide brought this up and basically, they couldn't support the business, so they depended on this dairy business. The Biltmore was essentially a roadside attraction. There was nothing over here, less than 10,000 residents. Why? The story says that they moved here because of the mountain air would heal George Vanderbilt's mother. But this is just what they repeat to us. Why aren't people rushing over here on your grandparents' train? There should have been plenty of business for this, yet it failed. And there were actually many critiques at the Biltmore who do not enjoy their stay. So basically, the building started to deteriorate. Wallpaper was falling off, and it wasn't until really the 1950s that major renovations started happening. Now they say that all these people came and visited, and they had all these journals of the people and their quotes and whatnot, but this is something that was heavily integrated with the media. As the president, Theodore Roosevelt, visited the Biltmore and even his daughter Alice, which they had like this whole story that takes 30 minutes on the tour and they tell you all about it. You know where we get all these events from? The media. The press. Hmm. Who started the Associated Press again? Also, did you know that on the Biltmore Estate, the Shiloh neighborhood included approximately a dozen former slaves? It included several homes dotted along what once was the land of their former owner, a church, and a cemetery. When Vanderbilt brought this property, he paid $1,000 to the church. Okay, so wait, they're telling you there were slaves on that property and there used to be a church there. Hmm. Okay. Now, we must cover what I consider to be more constructed figures known as the two architects behind the Biltmore House, which dives us into a deep topic too immense for a single video, which involves what I consider to be fake architects. Richard Morris Hunt was also the architect for other houses by the Vanderbilts, designed this house in a chateauesque style, which seems to be based on Wadison Manor. Keep that in mind for later, but they have many similar features. This is also the Rothschild's vacation home. Remember, supposedly, their families had nothing in common, but they visit each other and stuff? The other architect, Frederick Law Olmsted, now, we'll come back to Hunt in a second, but Olmsted is a big deal. He's responsible for not only Central Park and many other sites, but he's also the architect behind the Chicago's World's Fair. The story goes that they searched and searched for a land to hold the Chicago's World's Fair, as these events were huge cultural and technological leaps in mankind, so they knew they were a big profit. Also indicating that these architects, or supposed ones, they were a business. I'll show you what I mean in a second. They say they went to the France exhibition, learned what they needed, came back, settled with Jackson Park site, and you'll always hear this story that people were pessimistic. They doubted them, like in every single one of these biographies. But these men who built America, no. They were there to prove everyone wrong and that anyone could do anything if they just worked hard and all this stuff. But yeah, 
They were having a meeting in 1891, trying to discuss whether or not they could really build this all in two years, and they just wanted everyone to be well aware that they were confident. Even if this is plaster, there are no construction photos of this process. Maybe a few close-up ones with some scaffolding already there, but that's all. They're already in their final stages. Now, that may be convincing for the masses, but not for me. How do they make these embankments? How do they dig this all out? I don't care if this is just plaster and wood. If it's so easy to just buy all these cheap supplies and make something like this, then why has it never truly been replicated? This would have been a massive business. This is far too big of a project to complete regardless of the resources used and these wealthy elite building these places had more than enough opportunity to document everything they were doing. I mean, we're talking about people with trillions in wealth. They had the tech, why do we see high quality photos of the fair, yet two years ago, they don't have detailed construction photos of their mansions? If you're one of these exposure people and or the tech for photography wasn't there, that's the mainstream narrative. This is not new tech and these world fairs were most likely places where old world technology was finally re-engineered and presented to the public for the first time. This was their way of releasing new information to the public in terms of innovation. You don't think there would be propaganda involved? There's another thing that I don't get. Everybody just trusts all these people blindly and yet, who are we talking about? We're talking about the wealthy New York elite who had started other business ventures essentially making partnerships with these artists, sculptors, and architects, which I do think there are some high talent hired, but overall, these are all different businesses. Olmsted was one of their biggest corporations when it comes to these architectures. This dude was connected with Yale and basically was trained to be this architect. Like many of the celebrities today, these artists would go through thorough training and then be sent around the world in order to prepare seems that he had help if you ask me because he's the guy who's responsible for over 500 commissions how much money do you think this is 100 public parks 200 private estates 50 residential communities and 40 different colleges now that's insane and you'll see this with many of these different architects but remember we're covering the alternative here you have to think that if there was something going on, and for just one moment, let's suppose there were people in America far earlier than we're told. Perhaps when the Europeans came to explore, there were already cities here. This is not out of the question just yet, and when you think about it, they would have some system-wide cover-up for this, especially the leftover ones that were then reserved for the elite. Okay, so back to Richard Morris Hunt. So in the biographies, it doesn't want to go over exactly how all these different family members got into all these mansions. It seems to have happened right when William Henry died or right when the Commodore died. William Henry bought all these supposedly and then they were given to his children. But Richard Morris is the same architect behind the building we mentioned in the last video. The Petit Chateau or William K. Vanderbilt's house. Another young bachelor who was going to get a bunch of money from his father, William Henry. They never explain why William Henry was into Gothic architecture. Sure, you can say that George Washington Vanderbilt learned this from the books. Okay, that's one thing, but how did William Henry get involved in this? There's just not enough information about Fifth Avenue, and I found some early pictures that show clearly these buildings have lower levels that go below the ground. Sure, you can make the argument that their basements, but why are their windows going below? And how difficult would it be to build this way? Furthermore, why did they decide to demolish it? You know how much money a place like this could have made? This was another palace for princes. This guy is also responsible for the breakers, the marble house, the lower section of the Statue of Liberty, which I find very hard to believe in the photos of France because it does seem to be a composite if you ask me. But we continue. He built the Ochre Court, New York Tribune Building, Bluth High School, which seems to be way too much for a high school. But essentially, they're saying they built hundreds, if not 
thousands of these structures in less than a 20 year period. They had at least 10 mansions in New York, many of which were destroyed. They owned all of Fifth Avenue, and we aren't going to start asking questions on how and why this was done. There's barely any photographic evidence for their claims from this, and this is 1870 to 1890 time period. And all of a sudden, 1890, they start deciding that they're going to take stages of the construction process, but even then it's very limited and only a select few are shown as if they are chosen to be presented. You must think, if these were truly philanthropists and they had so much wealth, why didn't they develop a better system for preserving photography? They preserved books, tapestries, maps, yet they could not preserve photographs for just 50 years so that people could copy them later? I think they're hiding something. So yeah, these are the people that they tell us built the Biltmore. Yet, with almost all these figures, there's usually only one real photograph of them. Maybe two, but rarely. And then you get these portraits of who they were and a background story and we just eat it up. No one asks any questions. Of course, I'm talking pre-1890. Once George Washington comes in, he was the new young trillionaire. Now, these were the true Kardashians because even though I was making that analogy earlier, it actually really applies now because George Washington, and I swear saying that over and over again just seems so weird, but George Washington Vanderbilt basically built the Biltmore to have as his own bachelor's pad. They say it was originally for hunting, yet it ended up being used kind of like a frat house. The elites of their club would come for what they say was an extravagant experience and also they tell us that there were like only three people living in there for a certain period of time after it started to fail right because come to find out people don't want to take this massive long journey to the middle of nowhere they had many guests they tell us but i'm not sure if i'd buy it because they would have been successful and the place wouldn't have been deteriorated and needed renovation in the 50s so now I'm going to explain my experience going to the Biltmore with Moon. And after explaining all that, I'm going to give you multiple possible explanations, and you can decide for yourself what you like the best. Okay, so I know that was a lot, but you gotta understand what I'm about to say is pretty drastic, and I had to have some sort of foundation for assisting people in understanding how we come to these thoughts, but instead of jumping right into it, I feel the best argument is to simply just go over the history as we just did. Now we're prepared to go through this and ask some questions. So okay, you got your ticket, you're ready to see the Biltmore. You enter through the entrance and many expect to be able to see it from the street, but you can't. There are trees blocking everything and it's deep on the estate, you won't see it for a while. Which also, I never mentioned there are so many trees here and I'm talking massive amounts of land, but in the older pictures there's no indication of any type of nature which I also find odd, or at least it looks drastically different than it did today. Okay, so you have to drive for a couple of miles in which you pass under an interesting bridge, then you continue to find parking, take a shuttle, and after 30 minutes from originally entering, you're finally at the Biltmore. First note, when you enter the gate, there are sphinx that guard the gate. So you come in and they drop you off, so yeah, here's what it looks like up close. Now, we're going to be observing many symbols, and it's important to constantly ask, why and when did the Vanderbilts get such an interest in this level of symbolism? Do you guys notice anything? Why is there a lion statue in front of the door? What does William Henry or George Washington have to do with lions? How would he know about this unless there is some type of secret club we don't know about where they learn about all this symbolism. Look at all the ornate detail. The level of art put into this is insane, and we never see any photos of them doing the detail work. If you look closely, you can see that there are coat of arms at the top of the building, and they each are saying different things. You can see gargoyles, weird faces everywhere, almost like peasants or something. You see these over the windows, over arches, in every possible place, they added insane amount of detail as we will see. It's much better to come early, as later in the day, 
it gets extremely crowded. So we walked around the left section where you can go right under the arches and see the pillars up close. So first off, it's pretty amazing, not gonna lie, but to be able to just chill under there as we were taking photos, we noticed that the pillars had these floor de -lis, but they also had the older form, which was the dagger or the sword, which again is royal symbolism that has been seen on coat of arms for hundreds of years. Why are they putting this here? Now, of course, people might say French inspired, but is it? Because we're going to explore that even further. Okay, so we go into the court side with the garden where there's this massive empty space where there used to be a pool, but now it's just gravel. But over here, you can see a couple interesting things. Over here is a windy tree that's pretty cool. And also, you can see the back of the house. Check this out. Look at this bottom base and how old it looks. To me, I don't really think they did that with the simple pulley system, and it seems to be done without mortar. Also, you can see that it continues to go underground. We go down to the courtyard to see a pan fountain, which you'll see multiple references to pan here. Then you get your first bit of programming with one of the architects, of course. And there's these very interesting terracotta bowls here. Now, of course, I'm not denying that these can be created in the modern day, but I was looking at them and I got a weird feeling that they were actually very old. Again, symbols everywhere. Why were they so obsessed with painting such ancient symbols on everything they do? It just looks like old Venetian artwork to me, but just take note of this for later. There are some beautiful views here that are truly breathtaking. It has like this weird silence to it when you come over here too, it's, it's definitely peaceful. Also, the statues are interesting, but they didn't seem to be that old to me, to be honest. So, from here, you can also see that on the top of the building, there are more coat of arms. You can see two griffins. Griffins? Why are there griffins on this building? They seem to be holding a chalice. And this is all coat of arms stuff. All right, so now to the other side, which seems to be lacking in detail for some reason in comparison to the left side of the building. But if we go towards the right, there is this arch that leads us to an entirely new section. Now, before we go in, let's take a look at this griffin symbol which is kind of hard to see, but it looks like it's a griffin and a horned stag with wings holding up this emblem, which is a V. The symbol, they say, is for the Vanderbilt, and it can be seen in multiple areas of the house. This is crucial to note for later. Okay, so we're ready to go into the other building that has the cafe and the bookshops. We go under the arch, which is massive, but the first thing we notice is that once you get to the other side, there's this brick pavement that's completely messed up and there are crosses which seem to be religious that are ingrained within the pattern. This place is bumpy and not level at all, almost as if an earthquake happened. Now, no one seems to know why it's like that, so this next building is similar in design but slightly different and it's also very interesting. They have these brick glossed insides like new york but it's kind of like fake actually the whole encasing of the whole building is fake the original building is built entirely of brick and so they encased it with limestone imported from indiana this is what the guy was saying so they had to build their own brick production factory yet there are no photos of them actually laying all these bricks which we're talking hundreds of thousands of bricks and massive stones as well Exterior construction photos, okay, that's one thing. But notice how there's no interior construction photos. So we head to the bookstore to see what wonderful books they may have. And not only do they have biographies, but they also had this basic little propaganda book that told you everything you needed to know about this place. And so as we were checking out, we noticed that there was these old maps on the wall. And the person at the register was telling us that, basically, George was some big collector of old maps and that definitely piqued my interest the first one is old world spain okay and then the second one is a map of 
the Netherlands. They also told me specifically that he had one of Ireland, which was super interesting. Okay, so we head our way back and you can see this massive wooden door under this arch. Now, from what we learned, there's a massive amount of old world furniture in this building. Now, they say that every one of these doors were designed to have these specific folded carvings that you can see basically in every room of the house. Okay, so we took a quick break, went to the Leonardo exhibit, which was pretty cool. They had some weird inventions, but it wasn't really our main focus or anything, but it was kind of interesting that this was showing at the same time. Okay, so we prepared for a tour and basically we just came and they gave us some audio phones and we were ready to go. So to speed this up, basically the tour we went on was the guests of the Bill Moores and don't get me wrong, we loved the entire experience, but it just wasn't what we came to do. It was more focused on like the guests after the 1900s and the people who'd stayed there and all these renovated rooms that to me looked like they were from the 60s, but we weren't allowed to take any photos of this tour, which trust me, we got photos, but we just weren't allowed to on this guided tour. Um, but we did go on the top of the building, which was cool. So we did get some more up close shots of all this detail and a pretty cool view. But yeah, we couldn't really explore on the guided tour, but afterwards we had the opportunity to go on the self-guided one, which was really awesome. We walked around and I'm about to break down what I learned. Okay, so this place is massive. First you have the garden area, which is super nice, with also this interesting mosaic on the floor. I didn't mention, but basically in order to start the guided tour, they basically gave each person like a card and this would be someone who stayed at the house. Now, everyone really just got a basic guest, but for some reason, I was given Carl Bitter. Now, when this happened, me and Moon looked at each other at the same moment. We were like, no way, because I'm not sure you guys know. I mean, I have said that I've done 3D art, but I started off doing sculpting, clay, and pottery. So I'm pretty much a sculptor in my spirit. And it seems that the tour guide either knew or for some reason that card was given to me, but I can tell you right now, that was not a coincidence. Carl Better is an Austrian sculptor similar to these architects who is credited with a massive amount of sculpting that seems to be another attribution process. But that doesn't mean he wasn't a sculptor. You don't think these wealthy elite need the most talented sculptors and artists in the world? Well, come to find out, Carl Better is just another royal family upbringing. He was trained for this in Vienna. Okay, so where do we start? There's this part of the trip where you go into the biggest room and we get to take photos up close to really look at this. Now, look at the size of this fireplace. Look at this Roman Greco relief that is placed here. And is that a symbol? Right on the massive fireplace is a coat of arms. When I asked the guide, hey, is that a knight's helmet? And he said, hmm, I never really thought about that. Yes, that's what it looks like, but don't quote me or take my word. That's what he said, and he's in the building every day. Let me show you. There's no question on what that symbol is. What is it doing in this banquet hall or opera? As yeah, there's also a massive organ in this room that originally had pipes but they had installed new ones so that they could automate it and all this stuff but so why do you have the headless knight an organ massive dutch tapestries that are 400 years old and honestly they really do look real to me not to mention all the german wood this is a very common theme the wood is just imported from europe and this is just an invaluable amount of money it's literally unlimited what you are witnessing when you come into this building is an old world collection that doesn't line up with the story as we'll soon see look at that tapestry on the right another pan scene why does george washington vanderbilt want all this stuff are people not going to ask how the heck did they get all this and is there some type of dutch brotherhood or even more ancient family behind all this? Why can't we ask those questions? Here is a chest that seems to be German or Dutch old world furniture and 
these are in the finest condition. So, this is the first room of the guided tour. Interesting ceramic pieces, and if you look at the andirons, those are pretty cool. You have the fireplace, and even the decorative ceiling. On to the next room, you see these massive hanging fabrics. Another import along with most of this furniture, so a lot was spent on fabric here. And I forgot to mention actually, on the guided tour in the guest rooms, where we're not allowed to take pictures, they actually called these the Louis the 13th room, the Louis the 14th, 15th, and so on, which I just found strange, especially with the last video. I kept asking him to elaborate, but he said it's just because of the furniture style. So I don't know, but it seems really weird. So now we get into an important room and this is the music room. This fireplace has a very interesting clue for us. We see an engraving with a clear Albert Dürer engraving. And I knew this at the time because his art style is very noticeable. But another thing that I didn't mention on the guided tour is that he kept saying that George was obsessed with prints and he had thousands of original engraving prints and that they were all over the house, some of them being of ancient castles, which was just really weird to be in his collection. And they're like all these gothic castles, but this was his inspiration and all. So, but look at what's below the engraving. There are multiple reliefs showing an emblem with a date. At a closer look, we can actually see that it's a J, not a 1. Whoa, wait, you're telling me that George Washington Vanderbilt had studied so much art history and symbolism to such a degree that he was even aware of how they used to put J's instead of a 1? Why would he want to get this built in unless there's something else going on? Let's take a look at this engraving. This obviously was very important to him. This is the only one of his size that's showcased in this matter. I found that image online so we could take a look at it. You know what this image is? It's called the Triumphal Arch of Maximilian. At the top, you have the Vatican fish hats and also crown, which is the symbol for the Phoenician royals. Furthermore, we see torches giving the symbol of Prometheus as they are the ones to bring it. And remember Cornelius Vanderbilt's ship? Oh. Why is there more pan symbolism? One time, okay, you say that's just, you know, allegory in a painting or just like myths or something, but tell me why there are multiple different instances of pan being referenced at the Biltmore. Then we have at the bottom of these pillars a very interesting symbol. Hmm, what's that, a V shape? Remember this for later. Now, before we go on, we have to understand what this is. This is a royal family descendant tree. They're telling you what's going on. Maximilian was a Roman emperor and is letting you know everyone who was in their control. Type in Maximilian coat of arms or even the house of Habsburg. Why is it a double headed phoenix containing several other coat of arms? And that's actually what we see in this engraving. You can see the same Vatican hats here as well, so yes, they are connected. This is royal family lineage stuff, and we're just supposed to believe he put this up because he was a collector? Let's really look at this. There's so much to break down in this image alone. What do you see? The emperor in the center, Venice with the lions on each side, but also the double-headed phoenix, meaning they control both sides. To the left and right, you see all the different countries they own. These are all servicing the main emperor. They are not individual nations. For some reason, we're taught that in history, yet no, they still had control over these nations in the 1500s. Look at the griffins. Now, does that make sense why they're griffins in the Biltmore? Sure, you could say that George was just a fan of Albert Dürer, but that's just accepting the mainstream narrative. Why? And they never tell us that he was interested in symbolism, so why is he interested in this piece specifically? If you look at all the ornamentation, it's the exact same thing that you see with the Biltmore. It's the same people, but we're told that he was just inspired, so he decided to make it a French chateau. 
Okay, but why is there a Roman Emperor engraving implying that they own all nations and that they serve Maximilian? Why would he put that there and not only that, make it his prized selection? Let's continue. So there's this little porch where we chilled for a bit and it's really pretty but you can also see more views of the stonework in the back and also more detail work all over the pillars. The next room is the tapestry room and there's a bunch of old world furniture here too. Look at this clock, this is pretty crazy. Also these lamps too but they kind of had these all over the place but I was really impressed by this German wood. I just thought it was insane and the cost just had to be unimaginable because these are hundreds of years old. These tapestries are 300 years old they tell us and they show these really weird scenes either biblical, mythical, or showing emperors. Now I think I should mention this, there's a lot of stag symbolism. Now I didn't capture all the instances but in the main opera room with the organ there was a lot of deer symbolism or the stag, which is really weird because outside the Biltmore is a place called the Grand Bohemian. Now, if you remember from our little history lesson, this should trigger an alarm. Not only is it right in front of the entrance, their symbol is the red stag. The stag is also the symbol for Hennessy, which has its own coat of arms. So, in this room, we get more stag symbolism. For some reason, it seems that George was very fond of this deer symbolism, hence the name Deer Park. This tapestry with the sun and also the early Christian Cairo seems weird to be promoting all this elite symbolism on these tapestries in your just hunting resort. So now we get to the library and on the guided tour we actually went up to the top level and I got to actually look at the books but I couldn't touch them. They had multiple books on metaphysics and just big, thick, massive old books. And on top of that, we saw a book that had to do with the works on cannibals or something. It was weird and we really couldn't spend that much time investigating. But what we do know about this room is that supposedly there are 10,000 books in this room alone. Okay, and not only that. There are 10,000 more in a private collection stored in a climate controlled room. Hmm, that sounds very similar to the Vatican. And that's just books we're told. He has thousands of prints, hundreds of maps, and all sorts of stuff that we don't get to see and they keep stored in the back. So essentially, the most rare stuff is probably not even shown. Then on top of the ceiling is a 300 year old painting that they say was imported from Italy and glued onto the ceiling or something. They say that the architect Hunt actually brought this before even constructing the place. Wait, so they're just purchasing ancient paintings and for some reason they're selling these to these architects and he knew that he wanted it before they even started building the Biltmore. Okay, so just look at this fireplace and I believe he said it was made of black marble. And then you have these vases in the room that they said are from ancient China and are 500 years old or something like that. And just basically everywhere you look you just see this ancient old world stuff and they're just flexing it. Even on top of that, George had the chess set of Napoleon. That's what he said but it wasn't out for display or something. So this really weird thing happened because we were in the library and we were looking around and it was starting to get crowded and someone said, wow, it looks like a room built for giants and me and Moon looked at each other and we were like, okay, that's weird. But yeah, even the guests that don't even look into Tartaria, I mean, I don't know, maybe they do, but still like people look at this and they, they think this is a room for giants. So now we get to the stairs. So they tell us that they built these floating stairs just by using rope, pulleys, and horses. I don't really buy that story and why should I? There's no evidence that they did so. I'm sitting here listening to this guy talking about how it was in perfect balance and it goes up almost like four stories. 
So I think we need a little bit more explanation on how they managed to make this beautifully balanced floating staircase. But no, we continue through a bunch of more things that aren't necessarily worth showing as it kind of becomes guest rooms on the second floor. But there was this weird thing where the tour guide said that they had the Ark of the Covenant. And then he's like, ah, oh, just kidding. But they had this replica of the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm over here thinking like, wait, why? Why do they have this? And it has lion feet on it. it, has all these ancient symbols. And I'm just like, okay, they had to know about ancient tech or something. So to continue, before coming to the Biltmore, I was told by many that there are actually several underground tunnels there in multiple areas. There's this underground tunnel all the way at the winery, which is miles away. This entire Biltmore features the largest basement in the United States, and both buildings feature tunnels that connect to each other's below ground level. It's built completely on hilly landscape, and from what I was told, don't take my word on this, supposedly there's a tunnel that goes behind the Biltmore into an underground dumps. I was told this by many different people, and also with the news report we showed earlier, they were mentioning that there was tunnels that went to the Biltmore. So, I mean, how else would it be advantageous to hide from prohibition laws if it was just like it limited to your estate? So, I mean, these people were trillionaires. I don't think they had any reason to hide from the prohibition. These must have been tunnels that have been there for a long time. They weren't afraid of the law. They were the ones who put them in motion. They were married to the state legislators, the media. This is the oil oligarchy royal family with ancient origins. They don't care about no prohibition. This is not why the tunnels were built. The reason is, these are actually the lower levels of the building that did not go through the same renovation that the upper portions did. After coming back down the stairs, you actually can go to the basement. We weren't really sure about this. So you walk down this creepy underground tunnel, kind of strange feeling, and guys, I'm not going over any of that stuff, but I mean, it kind of ties in here, but you guys know that no really reason to cover it. But yeah, this leads to the bowling alley and the underground pool. Now here you can go and walk right beneath the building, but it seems very strange to me that there's no explanation on the creation of the basement or if it even goes further down, how do we know? We know that they built secret passages all around the house, so they were secretive. How do we know that what they are telling us is the truth? So, you know where these tunnels lead to? After you finish the tour and you're underneath the building, which deserves to have some honest questions. Instead, you're led to the programming room, which is kind of creepy because it's painted very weirdly and I have no idea why it was this way in comparison to the rest of the house or why they had the photos down here, but this is where they begin to program you with the narrative that they want you to believe. Do you really think that's all there is to this story? That what they tell us is the only story that we need to know? Well, if that's good for you, then there you go. That's theory number one, because the truth is none of us truly know the answer. The first option is that they're not lying. Everything they tell us is the truth, they really did build America. There's nothing really fishy about them and they just worked their way from poor to rich. That's the theory, which you already knew. So I'm not sure why you watched this entire video for me to just tell you that. When you go there, they're gonna have explanations. The people who walk into the bookstore are people who are curious on the origins. And so they have these books approved and ready to go for you to learn all this information all of which was not convincing to me. This main group, the anti-Tartarians, which seem to really enjoy this first option, don't seem to be aware of what they're even saying or promoting. They think that we should just all walk into gift shops, take these books, and then just accept whatever they tell us. Well, I think that's just contributing to the control and information without allowing people to truly be free by thinking and asking the questions they want to ask. But instead, they will repeat whatever the authorities tell us 
and then mock others for trying to get to the bottom of things. Most of these people are not taking into consideration many of the points I bring up such as the royal coat of arms, symbolism, waste management, fake and altered historical narratives such as Columbus being the first to discover America, and also like I showed, the secret connections of brotherhoods that seem to be behind all these architectures as evident by the coat of arms. This requires comparative skills that some are not willing to go into even when it comes to the occult. Therefore, they conclude that some basic construction photos that show just a few stages are all the proof they need. Well, it's not enough for me. Not only is it not enough, I don't really trust a word they say. I don't see why we should trust any of them. I feel like I've been fair, address the counter argument. Is it not possible that these are staged events, that this could have been orchestrated or planned? Not saying that they are fakes because taking two photos of different places and combining the negatives actually creates a physical real photograph so that it's not really a fake and future generations wouldn't be able to tell. Again, I'm not saying this was done, no one knows, we only know what they left us with, but we'll make this clear. In 90% of the case, this is the mainstream argument and the only point of those who object to this building having anything to do with Tartaria. Here it is. There's construction photos. That's the only point. But are you guys being fair? Are you covering the true history of the robber barons? Why should we trust them? Literally, the elite were hanging out with them, royalty in Europe. Well, I don't see why we should trust them. And so here is option two. It's a lie. Yeah, they're just lying straight through their teeth. Go through the biographies as we just did and really tell me that nothing is up for question. What about the Dutch connection? Is there a Venetian connection, a Phoenician connection? Remember that V we were looking at earlier in the Biltmore? They said that this stood for the Vanderbilts, right? Now explain when you look up Dutch East India Company, and you have to type in East, but remember, East and West are the exact same thing, okay? But this is their emblem. Look at this. It's a V, okay? And you know what the V stands for? The V stands for United. Hmm. But not only that, remember all the stag symbolism? Look at the coat of arms I found. You don't think there's a connection? Why do they all have the same royal coat of arms? Remember that headless knight? Look at it here. And we know that the Vanderbilts built America, made steamboat travel popular, and connected all the railroads. And we know that the Vanderbilts have Dutch origins in New Netherlands, which used to be old New York area, but it's actually underplayed and was far greater. It was the foundation of the United States. The Dutch East India Company were the true founders of the corporation of the United States. This is why we don't learn too much about them. They are the real Vanderbilts a royal founded corporation under the law and power of the throne of the Vatican, which was really controlled by the Phoenician Venetians. We're talking bloodlines, bloodlines that go back to early 1400s. The people responsible for all this are post reset. Now, I don't find the explanation of George accumulating all this art and collections of valuables from around the world to be convincing at all, as it makes more sense to attribute this to the Dutch East India Company, who had been sailing around the world for hundreds of years and had trillions of dollars. They were the first global corporation that makes sense that they had all these items and then used them to decorate the vast majority of these abandoned old world mansions with. Now we're going to go over two theories. The first will be for people who kind of believe the mainstream narrative, but they're willing to accept that there's something up, and so they'll step into the shallow end, right? Okay, so you see the connections with all that I've said. I think the next best explanation is that, okay, let's say that they constructed this. 
but the age and methods used are up for question. Remember, because their whole brand is that the Vanderbilt achieved the American dream. They started as poor Dutch farmers and just worked their way up from immigrants to becoming the wealthiest families in America. That is crucial for their story. So, let's say that's not true and that actually the Dutch Moravian Brotherhood of Royalty is involved and they kept this under wraps. They had special old world tech from a past civilization or they were keeping their progression in secret. For example, with the steamboat. They had this technology for a long time and slowly just released it out to the public. But in this case, they did so under the guise of capitalism. That seemed to be their main method of releasing new information to the public after the 1800s. Some random capitalist would just make all this progress out of nowhere. That way the state can't be blamed for being involved. Nowhere on the Wikipedia page does it say that he ingrained Dutch symbolism or heraldry, and that's important to note, because all it says is that it was inspired by French Renaissance. Because everyone knows that this Gothic style with the Florida Lee is typically associated with the French, but as I've shown you in the first chapter, it goes much deeper than that. So, they had other building techniques that they do not tell us about, meaning no, they weren't using pulleys and just a few men. This was an industry. There's no way they were just whipping these mansions out of nowhere in the 1870s. And again, I really don't see where the love and passion for this architecture came from. They all came from ignorant farmers with no interest in education. That's what we're told. They could have had some steam crane technology or machinery that we don't know about. And they just don't want us to know about because... That would imply they had tech we don't, and that also, this was not the ventures of a man wanting a country home, that this was some type of corporate operation. Now, that may be interesting to people as there's an indication that this was built on top of an older structure, so even then, I don't think they built all of it, especially if we consider underground cities as with Asheville and subterranean networks. We also know that the Dutch hired explorers to go find new ventures, so they would look for abandoned and ruined old world structures for them to go on these huge renovation projects. Which, we get to the final theory, which is my thoughts. I think they're liars. After comparing and contrasting, I don't think they considered that people would be able to see their fingerprints. I think the story of the robber barons is BS. I think the story involving the Dutch East India Company is highly exaggerated. Why should we believe them? If they're the ones behind all this, I got some serious questions, which is, why is this not known about? Well, it's because there was a reset, most likely within the last 500 years, in which an old world civilization went through multiple periods of systematic cataclysm, to the point of it being possibly a contrived event. These cataclysms caused earthquakes, floods, mudslides, and even comets that would be a sign of these dark times. The power of the old world was shifted into the Jesuits, who were in control of Rome, and the Vatican slowly moving their power across Europe and making their domination known. Their powerhouse became Venice as they began to rediscover many of the lost arts and sciences of the past age. They needed to begin disseminating this information to the public, but they needed to put their initials on it, because there couldn't be any knowledge of the old world. This was the book burnings. They erased the past and decided the world would be created anew. The new world. The new Atlantis. And so, Venice expanded into multiple powerhouses and brotherhoods throughout all of Europe, forming their own cults to please their master. Which really goes back to the Canaanites, Baal. This is their true god, as these people were inversionists. They began giving titles to the bloodline families that had been created through intermingling and these people were complete idiots. These are the people who began getting all the palaces and chateaus in Europe, right? And they would just shit all over them and act a fool like Marquis de Sade. They were totally fine with it because they were dark occultists. They had no intention on lifting humanity, but they wanted to enslave them. We get the first global corporation, started in America. They are the Dutch. The Vanderbilts are Dutch. We aren't going to ask any questions. 
How easy would it be to just make up all these figures and remember, they have the burden of proof. All I have to say is I'm not convinced and rightfully so as there are barely any details on these people and as when it comes to the Commodore, he even refused to speak in public. How do we truly know these people existed? Letters, pictures, okay, all of that can be fabricated by maniac trillionaires with a mission to control. So these Vanderbilts, once moving from converting from Dutch and they became English, they still kept their Dutch connections, but they'd never really tell you that in the documentaries. They don't want you to know that these people were a part of a club, the New York Club of Wealthy American Aristocrats, which out of nowhere and all of a sudden decide to create architecture that hasn't been created in hundreds of years and really no other nation is doing anything like this in the same amount of time. As I said with Fifth Avenue, I don't believe that story at all. And these were done in almost a decade and then demolished. Um, and then the same thing with the World Fair, all of us in three years. Or we just accept the official history of Asheville and not wonder how they built all these subterranean networks that connected the city. How did they build all these buildings in such a short time period? Something isn't adding up. I believe the Billmore to be an old world Tartarian mansion. I don't think those Phoenician hijackers can build with sacred symmetry at all. They aren't creative. They're copycatters. They're parasites. If they had tech then, why are there no buildings like this being constructed today? Okay, sure, maybe they had steam engines. I still don't really think they could do this, and I don't see the evidence for it. After going to the library and thoroughly researching the Vanderbilts, I'm not really convinced. There's a lot of red flags, and after reading the stories, I can't even really show you guys everything. There's just so much to cover. For example, with the story of the Titanic, J.P. Morgan, and how the Vanderbilt's trip were cancelled as if they may have known that something was going to happen. People are willing to accept that they did the whole Titanic thing on purpose for the insurance or whatever, but you know that means they lied, right? These people are scummy business people. Why should we believe the biographers? Why should we believe the media and not think it has anything to do with propaganda? Then people know all about the bloodlines, right? Freemason bloodlines, and this actually connects with the coat of arms again, but people are willing to accept that, but what I'm saying is too far. What I think is that these people are defacers. They are renovators, not builders. So yeah, it required sculptors, and yes, I do think they had talented artists, I know we have the video on ancient petrification, but that doesn't mean there weren't extremely talented artists at this time. And I do think they sculpted the fake facades as this was a part of turning the old world Tartarian buildings into a more modern look. Otherwise, it would be blatantly obvious how old this thing was. You know, there was this overall darkness because I kind of realized that ancient art and architecture was being used to continually facilitate these families ever expanding growth and wealth. Don't get me wrong, I was in awe when I saw it, but there was a feeling that something wasn't right. The ability to continually profit off of this is insane and I can't even imagine how much the Biltmore makes in a day. But overall, I do want to say I highly recommend going to the Biltmore. This isn't a promotion or anything, but my review is I enjoyed it, we both enjoyed it, everyone should go. They were really nice people, everybody, so please don't go there causing any type of trouble or anything. Many of these workers, they really just don't know. And I believe even the surviving Vanderbilts, they don't know either. At this point, everything is up for question, but the guy told me that the current Vanderbilt owners were just like normal people who came in wearing normal clothing to blend in. which. I kind of think may have some truth to it because like many of these elites that get these remaining architectures most likely don't know what's going on either. They were just transported here and given their own narratives and same goes for the modern Freemasons and politicians. They don't know the full history or narrative. There's levels to this, there's historical programming, and this just happens from the day we're born. 
The Billmore is literally a collection of old world art. And like I said, I believe it to be an old world Tartarian structure. So tell me, what do you think? Do you believe the mainstream narrative? Is there a connection to the Dutch East India Company and all their other ventures? What's with all the coat of arms? Do you think that's worth noting? Do you trust the Robert Baron story? I mean, we're told they are the enemy. What do you think about the Biltmore? Do you guys have any more details about Asheville that'd be interesting? I appreciate everyone who's gotten this far and thank you so much for everyone who supports us. We really enjoyed this trip and we'd like to continue exploring old world buildings for you guys and all you have to do is really just tell your friends. Tell your friends all about us. And so with that, I hope you enjoyed this one and all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?